Hey everyone, welcome to the Teller community call. Uh, June 22nd, more of a tech call today. Um, we're gonna be going over the Teller X white paper, so kind of a deep dive. Um, before we get started, kind of quick announcements. Um, we got a new Telly release, if you're a miner, um, go have at it. You guys know what that means. Um, we're also doing the Hack Money Hackathon. Uh, it's ongoing right now. If you guys have any questions, uh, definitely just reach out. Um, and then, you know, we have to touch on it um, just because it's kind of all over the place, but uh, the prices in crypto are down. Um, this is probably the fifth or sixth 50% plus drop for Teller. Um, probably like the third or fourth 80% drop for Teller. Um, it hurts every single time. Um, so just kind of stay in there, keep your heads up. You know, hopefully what we're doing today can, can give you guys some hope because um, this is, you know, we definitely see a lot kind of coming for Teller, a lot in the different use cases and um, a lot of just kind of the entire space in general is maturing and, and hopefully this this is just a great addition to the yeah. space to kind of be be here for the next, for the long run, not just, you know, right now or the products that are being used right now are not going to be the products being used in a year or in two years. And we just want to make sure that we set ourselves up uh, in the long run. So yeah. anything else? That's it. The future's bright. Uh, you know, our plans have been to make sure that we could handle these, these dips in stride as a company and we're there. So um, don't worry about us. Um, you guys just hang in there, stay positive. Uh, prices are temporary. Class is permanent. Remember that. Anyway, get started. Right. Uh, <laughs> was it, the joke would be like, yes, and we're all going to be lower class lower, for a long yeah. time. Um, Peasants. Yes. Uh, anyway, Teller X. Okay, so Teller X is the new version of Teller. For those of you that don't know or haven't heard anything about Teller X, we just released a white paper. It's on our website. Um, it's an update to the Teller system. This is things that it's not. It's not a new token. We're not on a different chain. We're not abandoning the old teller or anything like that. This is basically just an upgrade to the system, um, but it, it's it's a lot bigger than say some of the other upgrades, which have just been say like adjust the difficulty or you know move to just some small variable tweak. This is kind of a big overhaul. We're moving um, a lot of different pieces, and and it's going to take us probably you know six months to build. So. Just to kind of get your guys' expectations out there, um, I'm building it kind of as we, you know, this morning I was working on some of the code, so uh, we should be finishing up with kind of the initial draft of the code. I'm going to push that probably later this week. Um, then we'll be doing testing for the next two months. Um, it's just how much you should test code in the space. Is we're going to write local tests for every foreseeable thing, uh, test on rink B, and then we, we scheduled an audit. An audit starts in September, September 1st. Uh, audits usually take about a month, a bunch of feedback back and forth with the auditor. Um, so then we should be finished with an audit in October, make the final changes, test for another month, and then we'll launch in November. That's the time frame. Um, of course, this is crypto land, so you cannot hold us to it. Um, it is a very tentative timeline. Um, but as, as you guys know, like we, we've been doing this for a while now, um, building smart contracts. We're getting better at estimating how long it takes to do things properly. We're getting better at doing things properly. Um, and, and we're also, you know, we're not like one of these research teams. Um, the things that we're trying to do in some of the code, it's, it's all relatively simple code. We, we want to use just the basics of crypto economics and tokenomics to secure this stuff. You know, we're not using any crazy zero knowledge proofs or any, um, you know, weird cutting edge assembly code that that's doing something that nobody else can do. It's just how we, we package them together. Um, that's sort of the novel thing um, that we're doing. So on to Teller X. So Teller X, we can split into three categories um, that we're kind of overhauling for the system. The first is the Oracle. So this is data. This is the data. So how do we get data on chain, off chain? 
uh, for people to read. The next, um, uh, we, we call it monetary policy. Um, you, more of like the, the traditional finance way of saying this is like us being a central bank. Um, and then last but not least is the governance. And all three, you know, in, in the old teller system, they were all really sort of tightly bound. It was, we were an oracle that printed tokens and uh, there were disputes that you could vote on with the tokens. And that was about it. Um, it wasn't really sort of these separate structures in, in a way, but we're, we're moving to each, each of these things is, is kind of its own separate structure. So the oracle, of course, everything's kind of underneath this governance umbrella. Um, but it's a little bit different than, say, the old system, which looked more like, you know, a traditional proof of work coin in a lot of ways, where you had, you know, this minting token. So your monetary policy was sort of tied in with your um, kind of the, the data feed or, or the, the techno, technological process. And, and we're separating that out and we're going to explain. So which one do we want to hit first? Should we go in order? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so just going in order. Uh, okay, the big, the big change um, in terms of what we call these things, uh, we, we did a little internal survey with the team. Uh, they're no longer miners. These are reporters. Um, what were the losers? We had scribes. Uh, what did you like? Um, uh, uh, contributors. Contributors. He just liked it because the word tribute was in there. Um, but so th there were other ones like I liked High Priestess. That one <laughs> didn't fly. Um, we're calling them reporters because miners, even now, it was confusing for people because we're not traditional proof of work mining. But people aren't. Now we're stripping out any sort of semblance to mining. Uh, so we don't want to call them miners and have confusion whenever people say, come be a miner on Teller. So we're calling them reporters. They get to report on the system. So let's see, what are the big changes for the Oracle? Um, the biggest change um, is bytes data. Um, I say this is the biggest change. You know, most users probably won't notice the difference about what our people are submitting and what they're reading. Um, but this is increases the flexibility. So I'm sure as most people know, Teller is actually just numerical data right now. So a price of Ether, a price of Bitcoin. Um, how, how do you get to be more flexible than that? You know, we're having some people who want us to, to pass over, say, some information about another chain. It's not just a uint or, some, or any sort of numerical data. It's a whole block header or a whole piece of information, a string. Um, we want to be able to bring those on. And that's why. We're moving to bytes data. It can still handle numerical data. If you're currently using numerical data, it, you just have to parse it. It's super simple. Um, OK, so the other cool thing about the bytes data is, is that it can be more than just one number. So like right now, we can have, you know, like ID1 is, say, uh, BTC US dollar. And then uh, we could make. Uh, ID ID one could eventually become say an array of BTC ETH um, you know TRB or even the S and P five hundred and then you could have an array and this is much more gas efficient so now every time somebody wants to you know put a piece of that on chain this is just they're putting one on chain per transaction. Now we can put a lot more on chain per transaction. Um, now some of you might ask like, well, why wouldn't you just make it every data point now and start pushing them on chain? And adding each one does add gas costs, um, especially for the person reading it. Uh, so until it's actually utilized, uh, you wanna sort of keep them small and, and to the ones that are actually being utilized. That's another thing that we wanted to fix with this. So as, as we're kind of going through this, just Make sure you're thinking about the gas costs of all this. So as most of you know, Ethereum has gotten really, really expensive. Kind of every chain gets more expensive with usage. We don't really want to be pushing a bunch of data on chain that's not being used. We want to pay people to push data on chain 
that is being used, that is actually wanted. If we're just bloating the state for no reason, that, that's no good. Um, so we, we want to move to a structure where it's, it's cheap to put data on chain, um, but we're not needlessly putting data on chain, if that makes sense. Okay. So the, the next big change is just how it works. So if you guys know currently the, the system works is uh, we, we have an array basically of there, there's 50 different prices about um, and you can tip them and we've, the system selects five prices that are the current block and they get mined and each five miners put five prices on chain and then those are the official values the median of the, the miners sort of selections. Um, but like we said, that, that's just putting only those five that are selected. You have to be one of the highest tips. We're getting rid of that whole block idea. Now, instead, each ID, so like ID, this is like the picture that we drew. Um, so like ID one, ID two, ID three, ID four, they all represent different pieces of information. Could be array of information, could be a block header, could be a price. Whatever, and if you want these, if you're a user and you want somebody to go on there and somebody to report on this data, you would go and you would tip it. So you would put some TRB in there or some, some lawyers, some fraction of TRB. Um, and then the reporters would come and say, hey, there's you know $10 worth of reward. It's gonna cost me $9 in gas to submit this. I'll do that, here's the price of Bitcoin US dollar, you can put it on chain. And that's basically how the system works. Um, the cool thing about it is, so we're still keeping the time-based rewards. So we, we represent this with uh, the hourglass in the white paper. Uh, that's pretty cool. Um, so just to kind of keep the system going and to make sure that the miners at least initially have some sort of you know, they can estimate that they're going to get some reward in the system. Uh, this, these are time-based rewards. So let's say this person submits for ID one, he gets half of these. So like this, this reporter over here, uh, he's going to, he'll get half of these, so one and a half, and then he'll get whatever is in the time-based rewards. The other one and a half is burned. You guys remember, we, we're still burning half of the tips. Uh, so he would get those as a reward. And that reward would basically just have to be greater than his gas cost. The next person, so say there's only like two in here, once he takes the time-based rewards, they go back to zero and they start filling up again. The person who is requesting ID2, he can either add more tip to get it done right now, or he can wait until the time-based rewards get high enough that somebody else will. Allow it. Sorry, letting Chris in. So, any questions so far? I think we're we're on track. Um, the cool thing about it is, is eventually, this whole thing doesn't even isn't even necessary. You hope it, we get to a point where it's all just tip based. There's enough tips coming in that people are tipping and covering gas costs, and if you want, and it also can be as fast as you need. So this was a big kind of. I guess it was a hard sell for us on a lot of things with the current teller is like, well, how fast can you be? And we would tell people, well, you know, we, we can put your data up every five minutes. Um, and, and that was about as fast as we could go. And there are a lot of reasons why you don't want to be sub five minutes. Um, we're not really going to solve those issues. Those are more have to do with like the fact that you're on Ethereum. Um, but these, there is no time limit. If you wanted a person to put it up every single block, you could just tip, like, um, if you would go in there and say tip 50 bucks worth of TRB every single block, somebody will be putting those prices up on chain to get those rewards. It is as fast as you want to pay for. And that's, that's a really cool feature in this system is that this ID can be as fast as it wants, this ID can be as fast as it wants, all the IDs put together can be as fast as they want. Um, and they're not sort of limited. The only sort of limit in the system would be actually the number of miners. Because what we're doing is, you don't want a system where you have a whole bunch of gas races. And 
it just turns into there's one guy he stakes once and he reports for every single one. So we're actually locking them out of the system. We actually do this in the current system, but it's sort of creating this artificial demand for more miners because it's increasing the amount of competition in. So once he submits, uh, he is locked out of the system for 12 hours initially. And this is a variable that the governance can set. So once he does it, he posts a price on chain, somebody else needs to come to do it for the next price. Because this is, this is filling up. That's per address, per stake. This is per address. So I mean, obviously what's gonna happen, like we already know, even with the current system, you have several miners who run multiple addresses. So that'll probably be the same thing. So it's going to be an initial stake of we're still working on the final amount. It's going to be somewhere in the range of about 100, um, maybe 200, depending on what the price is. Um, but it's going to be a lot less than the current stakes. So they'll, they'll come and they'll stake and then they'll, they'll be able to do it. So if they want to say they can split up their current stakes and, and have multiple of these guys. Um, also the emissions. So like this is in the current system as well, for those of you that don't know, um, the time-based rewards. Currently we drip uh, five TRB every five minutes, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, five TRB every five minutes. Uh, but we have to, they have to split that between all of the different miners. There's five miners per value. This one, we got rid of the fact that there's five miners per value. There's only one miner per value. So we can drop this. If you wanted to keep the same inflation, same reward per miner to keep the system going, you could drop it to one. But we actually want to reduce it less because it, we want to encourage the tipping system and we don't want to, if this gets too high, what happens is the miners are the ones tipping themselves and you're needlessly putting data on chain. We want to stop that. We have some base demand now that we don't need to do that. So we're going to be reducing it uh, from five per five minutes all the way down to 0.5 for five minutes. So that's 90% drop. Uh, so get excited token holders, we're mm -hmm. reducing inflation. But then we're gonna, we'll talk about that monetary policy. Um, Cause maybe we are, maybe we aren't, or we're, we're figuring that it's gonna be, inflation is actually fully up to the governance. And the reason is, is that we're not, in this world where this is actually minting. It's funded by the governance contract. So this thing is going to be minting at this rate, meaning it's putting them out into circulation, but it's going to have to have this in its supply. It will eventually run out the contract and the governance, you'll, we're gonna have to vote to keep this going. So like initially, whenever we launch TellerX, we're gonna fund it for a year. If we wanna keep inflationary rewards on ETH, we refund it again. We can change this rate also, um, but maybe we're in a world where we don't need them. Or maybe we're in a world where we want more um, because you can imagine, so if users have to pay a lot of tips to get it on chain, the higher this is, this is basically subsidizing your users mm -hmm. if, if you're pulling away from their gas costs actually. So um, there are also other ways to subsidize users, which we can talk about, but you don't necessarily, it's not like a, this is just direct inflation minting to, you know, profit hungry miners. It also promotes usage in the system because it makes it cheaper for other people to actually get some data on chain. So, okay, I think, is that it for you, Oracle? Um, yes, so disputes, um, disputes work basically the same way. Um, there is no change to disputes. Uh, the biggest change to the disputes mechanism is that it will, since we're going to have a whole lot more of these guys, it's going to be a whole lot cheaper to initiate a dispute. Um, and we're going to be working, since the data can be really, really fast, um, we're going to have to make sure that we really work on how do we monitor these things and get these disputes almost really, really quick whenever things pop up. Because let's say a, a new bad values start popping up really, really fast. You want to make sure that you can catch them and, and sort of pause those. So that's more of a software challenge. 
um, just building proper monitoring tools, but the dispute process in the code is going to work exactly the same way. Okay, that's the Oracle. Hopefully you guys are super excited about it. Um, the other thing which we can do is since it's staking based, um, there's no reason we couldn't deploy this exact system on another chain. So on Polygon, on Binance Smart Chain, people would just have to go stake TRB over there. It would work the exact same way. Uh, theoretically, people would have to tip less because the miners would need less of a tip to cover their gas costs because you would assume gas would be cheaper over there. Um, and the cool thing about it was with the monetary policy is you could vote, say, to have some inflationary rewards over there, kick off Binance Smart Chain mining for the first six months by having reporting. some... Reporting. Yeah, reporting, not mining. <laughs> um, so you, you could actually vote to have some... I guess some of these minting events over there. Um, and that gets into monetary policy. So the monetary policy, um, what's, you have to kind of think what's the goal of Teller's monetary policy. Anytime you have a sort of tokenomics or anything, it, it, you have to have a goal. So there's always like, well, the goal is a really ridiculously high token price. And well, Sort of. I mean, maybe in the really long run, but um, you want to make sure that you don't vote that in, you know, because like you can, you could theoretically say, well, if we just go slash, you know, 95% of the TRB out there, yes, the per value of TRB is going to go way up high, but you, you might be sacrificing the long term viability of your network. So it, it kind of goes into the goal of the whole system. And, and that's how do you create a sustainable community, a sustainable ecosystem that, that continues to grow and continue, you know, you have, you have investors, you have reporters, you have users, and, and it should be this relationship between them. Uh, that said, so monetary policy, the first thing I've gotten a few comments in the paper on, um, and, and that's just kind of what is the thinking behind how supply growth rates work and and what we're doing. So th there's a few ways that we can actually manipulate the supply. So a lot of people, especially newbies to crypto, they always ask about the total supply. Um, total supply is meaningless. Do not worry about the total supply. Um, because the total supply doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. Um, you know, the, the team could go mint ourselves a quadrillion tokens um, and we lock them in a contract for 20 years. Does it matter that there's a quadrillion tokens? No, I mean, not at all. It, it, it matters, what actually matters is the circulating supply. Um, how many tokens are floating around um, for people to buy? And this is really what you wanna, wanna focus on. Um, of course, you know, the total supply does matter more in like, uh, you can look at like the total supply in the next six months or in the next year, um, but you know, like people often say like with Chainlink, well, they have a fixed total supply and, and it's sort of a meaningless thing because like if the team holds 50% of the supply and decides to dump it on the users, you just had a hundred percent inflation. Basically, um, you still have these inflation rates. They just come from the team selling. That's why, you know, like even anybody that holds a really large portion of the token sort of off of the circulating supply, it's sort of not being filtered or not available for, for sale. When you put that back on, that's inflating the circulating supply and that's what you wanna minimize in some way. So how do we sort of move the supply up and down? Um, well, we have, so reducing supply uh, is basically the tips. Uh, every time somebody is tipping our network, Half of those are burned and it reduces the supply. Um, and then, so adding, so how do we add? Uh, we have inflationary rewards. Inflationary rewards. And then... Um, <laughs> your, hand, your handwriting is slowly going um, downhill. Yeah, and then we also have, so we still have the dev share which is now no longer tied to inflationary rewards. It's just, do we want to vote to give the team some tokens? Yes, no, here you go. Um, but then you can also add 
not via one of those things. So since we're moving the monetary policy to a pulp, fully to something we all get to vote on, um, maybe we could start a grants program uh, for users. We can all just vote on who, who gets the tokens. That's okay. Um, it doesn't actually have to be sort of tied in directly to the code. You, you can all just vote to kind of print money to people. Um, but the other thing, these are all sort of based on minting tokens. How do we sort of manage the, the circulating supply? So the number of tokens that are floating out there. Um, so, you know, circulating, uh, so going, reducing, basically, how do we lock up tokens? The only way we do it in our current system is reporters. So if we would, the more reporters we need, the more we want a lot of reporters because they have to buy tokens to stake and lock them up. That's how you remove tokens from supply. We want to encourage this because this reduces the circulating supply. And the other thing is we're adding in Teller Treasuries. This is something I'm super excited about. Teller Treasuries. Okay, so Teller Treasuries are basically staking pools. Uh, that's what we're kind of calling them. The entire goal of them is to reduce the circulating supply in the Teller system. Um, the way that it will work is, let's say, I don't know, the price of Teller is going down like it, it did. What we're going to do is we're going to mint, say, a quarterly treasury contract. So you lock up, so we're going to issue 100,000 tokens uh, into a contract. And in one quarter or one year, these are sort of, we can vote on the duration in them. Uh, you lock them in for a rate. And what's that rate going to be? Well, it's going to be whatever people are willing to accept that we can fill it up in. So let's say 2% uh, rate. And then in uh, one quarter, one quarter it mints out 102,000 tokens. So you can see there was 2,000 tokens were minted. But basically we paid people to lock up their tokens for a quarter. We can do it for a quarter, a year. Um, those are things that we can play around with. Now, let's say the price is really going up. Uh, we're back up to $300, things are moving. We don't need to do this again. We, we can say, we don't, we don't need to mint more. In fact, we wanna let some of these tokens out. And what they'll actually do is if 102,000 tokens moves into the circulating supply, you, you would expect that to sort of dampen the price, which would be a, a good thing. Um, you want to sort of have some way to prevent these really large spikes, so you're a more stable coin. Not a stable coin, but a more stable coin. And that way, whenever the price goes down, you say, hey, when the price was up, we let a whole bunch of tokens out. Now we're going to issue one, now that the price just tanked a bit, now we're going to issue one for 250,000 tokens and we'll be even given it at a 3% rate. So that way we really entice people to lock them up. And it's gonna be this sort of monetary policy that we're gonna to have to govern and we're gonna to have to vote on. Um, but this is, you know, this is one thing that I, I personally see a lot of projects who just open it up to everyone. Come initially, lock your tokens in for a 2% gain and everyone comes running in. And of course, you, you see a huge spike in the token price because that happens. Um, but then that's it. There, there's no stability mechanism whatsoever there. Uh, it just, you go up initially and then it, it's basically only down from there as people start pulling their tokens out. Um, and then you just have, everyone's locked in and then you have this inflation rate. Um, the cooler thing about it is, is we want to use it for price stability. I know a lot of people are like, well, why wouldn't you just want to use it for increasing, you know, the price of your token initially and then it can just stay at a higher level. And the problem with that is, is if you don't have any sort of ability to dampen the price effects, kind of like we're going through right now, um, a lot of the security, whether it's the disputes, the amount that people are staking, things like that, is tied to our token price. It's tied to our market cap. We want some way to be able to control that and be able to tell our users, hey, you know, listen, if the price starts going down, we have ways to boost it back up. 
But if you do it all initially and the price starts going down, you know, you're out of ideas. It's sort of like, you know, the Federal Reserve. Once you hit 0% interest rate, it starts start running out of tools. So that's the, the idea behind monetary policy. Um, the teller treasuries, it's going to be, it's going to be fun kind of doing this with people. Um, we'll probably start out small and, and then we'll, we'll grow them in size. Um, since these do fill up, what you don't want to happen too much though, which, which we're going to have to be careful of, um, if these 100,000 tokens were somebody, say Binance, the exchange, who's sitting on 100,000 tokens anyway, they're not selling them, uh, it does no good to give them a 2% reward. You want to sort of have it to where it's pulling tokens out of circulation in some way. And um, how we do that, maybe we, we auction it off something. Um, we're we're going to have to have ideas for how to fill it up and make sure that people are actually coming in for the right reasons. Cool. So, okay. I'll clear this off. All right. Um. And that said, uh, if you guys have not seen the pretty paper, uh, all the drawings. Uh, so I did a little rough outline, and then Ben, our designer, drew them. They're very pretty. We tried to go for a, a much more simple design than, you know, if you guys saw the, the chain link white paper, which was uh, 200 pages of nothing. Um, we wanted to really just be the opposite of that. Like, here's a nice condensed version of everything that we're doing. This is how it works. Uh, come reach out if you have questions. Okay, so the last piece is governance. Um, governance, the this kind of, it, it governs everything. You know, this, this sort of completes our tr transition to like a full DAO, basically. Um, you can vote on anything in the system and it, it's a completely community-based um, system because everything can be changed. So that's really exciting. But one of the problems that we had with the old system and, and I mean, even that I guess all of crypto has is that it, it was kind of a purely a token weighted governance. Um, so you had people who owned the most tokens, controlled things. Um, and, and this is okay. Uh, but the problem is, is that it's not really representative of everyone in the system. You actually have a lot of different stakeholders in the system. So you have the team, it's us. Uh, you have users, You'll, you have holders, and then you have reporters. Um, all these different people have different sort of priorities. Priorities, yeah, when it comes, you know, different self-interest Mm -hmm. and preservation when it comes to the system. So users want just the most stable system of teller that they can, and it provides really good prices. Reporters want the most money for reporting. Mm -hmm. um, they could maybe care less about the actual usage of the system. They just want more money. They could care less about the token price. They want, you know, the token price could be going to zero if we're inflating more for them. And the holders just want a really high token price. You know, for a lot of holders, if they could care less if we didn't even have a product if we had a really high token price. Um, so there's all of these kind of competing interests. You know, the, the team might be more interested in doing research or something and, you know, getting on talk shows than on actually having a functioning system. You want to have a way to balance it. Ideally, what we did is we crossed the team out. They actually don't get it. We actually don't get anything special set aside because we're sort of in with all of the above. But we, we wanted to, to weight the governance in the system. So every, basically every single thing in the system is a vote. We, we, everything will go to a vote similar to the disputes. Everything can go to a vote and then the result of the vote can be disputed again um, and again and again. So ultimately it comes down to what are the weightings of these different people. So, so the first is holders. Um, you're weighted by your balance. So this is token weighted governance. Ideally, you know, this is, there's a lot to say about, you know, the rich people who own the system 
and eventually maybe there's going to be somebody comes up with a solution or a more democratic way. You know, people have talked about quadratic funding and things like that, but it, it's still all, all new. Right now we're, we're making small improvements and we're gonna go from here. Uh, with users, um, what we're actually doing is for every tip that you give, um, 0.5, so half of the tip, becomes basically just a non-transferable token. So if you tip 100 tokens into the system, you actually get, what did I say? If you tip 100, you get 50 tokens worth of voting power. So this means if you're constantly tipping our system, you get more voting power. Um, and that's the way that we want it. Um, and then reporters as well. Um, if you submit a value, you get an NFT. <laughs> so voting right. So if, if you've submitted 100 values over the past few months, you get basically 100 TRB worth of voting power added on top. And what this will hopefully do is the, these people kind of have discrete interests, as we were talking about, and, and hopefully this will work to balance out the system in a little bit of a way um, that, that just having token weighted voting could not. Um, we, we worked hard at, um, like, people, people might ask, well, why is, you know, mining a value only worth one TRV? You know, shouldn't it be worth more? Or, you know, why is it half of the tip? Um, the reason is, is we tried to minimize attack vectors this way. So you want the security of Teller to be at least as much as, if you, if you can imagine the cost to break our monetary policy is basically if you hold 51% of the supply, um, or 51% of those tokens that vote, uh, then you can vote in something bad. Uh, so you could say that the security of Teller comes down to 51%, like the max, in a calculation would be like 51% of our market cap. Uh, we wanted to make sure that whenever we add these in, that that security doesn't come down at all. Um, it should theoretically only go up. And, or that's still the, the best way to break it would be, you know, trying to just buy tokens. And, and that's what we did here. So, you know, you wouldn't want somebody to be able to buy up 25% of the supply and then tip it all to the contract and then have 51% of the voting power or in the same way, you know, could they spin up a thousand miners and submit? Um, we did the math. This way works out that it's still, now you actually need greater than 51% of the market cap to, um, to submit. Obviously, how much it costs to submit as a reporter um, is more dependent on gas costs on Ethereum uh, than on anything else. And same with tipping does cost money as well on Ethereum. So over time, some of the things that we do know that we have to pay attention to though, um, let's say you have like one reporter for the next 10 years who is doing really good and he has, you know, 20,000 reports and then he wants out, uh, he might be able to just sell his voting rights, you know, sell his private key away. Um, you know that that's an attack vector, but that's, we, we know now like, um, reporter with gas costs on Ethereum, people just aren't submitting that many reports, so it's not that big of a deal. Um, you're, you're not gonna grow this number nearly as fast as you could if you just go buy the tokens. So that said, that's the governance piece. Um, as far as the weights, um, everything, so there, there's a bunch of different things that you can vote on. There's disputes, there's upgrades, there's new treasuries, there's uh, new data IDs. So that was another piece we didn't mention. Um, every new piece of data in Teller has to be approved by the system. And the reason that the, we're doing this is um, we, we, we've had some problems with people who add data that nobody knows what it is. Um, of course, now in the system, no miners have to work on it, um, but we wanna make sure that Anytime that that gets pushed to the system, people know what it is so we can validate it. You know, if it's bad data, we want to know if it's bad data and we can dispute it, not just people are pushing data that we don't know what it is. Um, the other thing that we actually, oh man, how did I forget this? Looking at the paper. Uh, delegates. So 
Last piece. Um, you can now delegate your vote. If you don't want to vote in the system, let's say you have 10 TRB, you can give it to us. We'll vote for you. You can give it to Binance. They might vote for you. I don't know if they vote. Um, you can give it to your buddy um, who wants to vote for you and who's active in this. Basically, you can give away your voting rights, which will be a sum of these ones, and that address can vote for you. Um, and that's a really cool thing that we can allow. Uh, what we're not doing, which I, I hate, is native delegation. So other projects do this, um, where you would say, like, everybody is instantly delegated to the team unless you go and claim your voting rights. Um, a lot of tokens do this. And basically, it just means that the team has complete control over the token. Um, we don't want to do that. Um, it looks like bad optics. Hopefully, we can earn your guys' trust and, and you'll delegate it to us or to somebody who's actually paying attention in the system so that the, the amount of people voting goes up. So I think that's it on Teller X. Um, I think I kind of talked a little bit about everything, some use cases and um, how it all should work. But I think we'll just go to questions. Uh, I think we have some Ryan. I think has them, but if you're on the call, feel free to reach out with any. All right. Question number one. <clears throat> Will the new teller be able to replace any other Oracle in its capabilities and not be limited to, numer to numerical data? And is there a significant difference between the speed of external data transfer compared to other projects? Um, yeah, so I think we had kind of touched on this one. It can do bytes data, so it can do any sort of data, um, and it can be as fast as you want um, being paid for it. You know, like right now, I think since it can be as fast as you want that you can pay for it, it is a lot better because if you know how like like the way the chain link works is that they have these set of reporters that are whitelisted and if you want data faster you go work off some off-chain agreement with them that says you're going to put data in my contract every two minutes and we'll pay you to do that um with this one a you don't have to do some off-chain contract you can just start tipping the system and it'll go faster um but yeah it's as far as like how much that's actually going to cost and things like that. Um, I think we're limited in the same way that Chainlink is, is that to ultimately get data on chain, you need an on-chain transaction. And, and that's really where the vast majority of your costs are gonna come. It's how much does it cost to store data on Ethereum and submit a transaction. So yeah, I mean, I, I think this puts us really competitive with even centralized solutions on the speed factor. Cool. And then, uh... When Teller X? Yeah, I think we had talked about it uh, right at the beginning, uh, November ish, maybe, maybe a Halloween present or something. Um, do we need to run an Ethereum node and cover any gas fees along with staking <clears throat> 100 TRB to become a reporter? Uh, so you do have to cover the gas fees. You do have to stake. Um, as far as running a node, you can use a service. So a lot of people use Infura. Um, but yeah. Yeah, and that, those are all the Teller X related ones. Cool. Um, no, those were good questions. And you know, we're still coding this. So if anyone's watching this and anyone sees any like major flaws in our logic or, or any ways that we can even make it better, um, definitely let us know. We're, we're open to, to changing it. You know, we're putting this out here while we're building it because we, we want people to tell us why we're wrong and to tell us how we can make it better. So, um, yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Thanks everyone for watching. Uh, next week we will be, uh, back to a normal community call and yeah, looking forward. See you all next week.